few years ago when my, one of my aunties had passed away, we had attended the funeral. Um, as we were leaving, they were asking family and friends to say their last goodbyes, and they invited uh, people to line up at the casket so that they can um, uh, say their, their, their last piece or make their peace. And as I watched my son at the time, a Zion who was about uh, five years old, he had um, looked with this, uh, uh, this look of curiosity. He was curious of why all these people were uh, going up to the casket and what was this about. And to me, it was a very, um, it was a great learning moment for me to share faith with my son. He turned and he asked, he says, Dad, uh, uh, why is everybody uh, uh, saying goodbye uh, to Auntie? What, what's, what's going on, right? And, and, and I shared with him, I says, well, Auntie's asleep, right? Because as we believe in our faith tradition that, that we are in a deep sleep. So saying that to a, a child who's five years old um, takes things very literally. So what happens is when we went home that night and uh, people started going to sleep, uh, Zion was running around the house making sure that nobody went to sleep. Because his thought was that if we were to go to sleep, that we were, we were actually, um, all, uh, we, would, we, would, we, would, we would be sleeping for a very long time. He didn't want anybody to sleep. He associated sleep with death, and he was so concerned because he took it literally that when I told him that Auntie is asleep, that he thought that all of us would end up in a So I took him aside and says, no, son, listen, you know, uh, we have a beautiful uh, a faith, a tradition, and belief that uh, when, when, when you pass, you're, you're in a deep sleep, and we, we await the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I got to share the resurrection with him, and I got to share this hope of Jesus Christ with him, and his eyes lit up, and he was so excited to know that if we go to sleep at home, that, you know, that it was going to be okay. But it, it, just as Castile had mentioned, you know, we, we, we always concern ourselves with death, and, and of course, death Death is something that is very painful. And the reason why death is very painful is because death is abnormal to the human experience. Because God did not create us to die. God created us to live. He created us to thrive. And so the reason why we're in pain is because this is abnormal to the human experience. But we have to understand that even through death, that death is not the end for those that believe in Jesus. That actually death is the beginning. So when, you, when, you, when you're in the presence of death or in the midst of death, understand stand as Christians. The best is yet to come. And this is something I was able to share with him, and, I, and it brought me back to this class that I was taking in my undergrad, and it was about child development. And they gave us this faith chart and how uh, our faith is developed and how it's nurtured. And it actually based these faith is on different um, age groups. So it starts off by telling us um, the infancy stage of faith. And when I share this with you, it's not, it's not something to point you out or point a finger at you, but maybe if you listen to where we're at, you could find out maybe where you're at in this faith chart or this faith development chart. And the emphasis stage is this, is like they're unaware of anything going on. And it's really great when I was reading this chart most recently is because I have a kid in every single stage of life that fits in this chart, right? So the infancy chart, it starts off with a newborn, maybe up to one, two, maybe three. And this faith development is, is, is something where the kids are very oblivious to what is going on to them. It was just, even in the environment of faith, they still are unaware of what faith is. They can't absorb it. They can't contextualize it. But they're just in the presence of this environment of these faith traditions or these faith beliefs. And maybe some of us today are in that position where we don't understand what faith is. We're just in an environment of faith. And Sometimes we're just oblivious of what God is already doing in your life. Because even though we're faithless, we serve a God who is faithful. And my question is, is where are we in this faith development chart? So it moves on over to, um, I'll say, Gideon's age, where it's a toddler's age. And this is, a, this is an age where it's a mimicked faith. They, they, they absorb what we're doing. They look at dad and mom, and as we, as we pray together, we, we, we fold our hands. And uh, when we fold our hands, they fold their hands, and we teach them how to kneel. We teach them how, how to quote scriptures, and, and, and it's a mimic faith. Uh, they don't really understand what they're doing. They're just doing it because we're doing it, so they're modeling what we're doing. And maybe for some of us, we're, we're in that stage. 
Maybe we're just doing it. And, and the, 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 the challenge about being in that stage of faith is that it becomes so ritualistic that we do things without even knowing the meaning behind it. So, for instance, we like, I shared this before, we tell, we, we tell Gideon, we're like, after, after, every, after every time we, we open Sabbath, we, we say, happy Sabbath, right? We say amen, and we jump up, everybody runs around and hugs each other. And like, Gideon, we could be at a, a restaurant on a Wednesday, and we'll be saying prayer, and then after we say amen, he'll jump up and go, happy Sabbath. I was like, son, it's Wednesday, you know? But that's his faith. It's something that he's trying to develop. The other is the adolescent faith, right? And, and actually, this, this, this faith here is, is the, studies show that probably 80% of church-going individuals are at this stage. This adolescent faith is this. It's a borrowed faith. It's a faith that we're inspired by a leader in our church. It might be a pastor. It might be a youth pastor. It might be a pathfinder director. It might be somebody of spiritual influence in their life that they love so much that they're inspired by them. But the only problem is that it's a borrowed faith. It's not really their faith. They're not owning their faith. You're just really inspired and moved by the faith of others. It's safe to say that many of us in our church circles that that is the case, that we haven't owned our faith yet. And that God calls us to own our own faith. And then we're just inspired. And the the, the problem with that is this, is that we become so inspired that it's become entertainment as opposed to been something life-changing and transforming in our life. Because faith is supposed to transform the way that you look at things, your perspective, the way that you think. And then prayerfully, that faith helps to change the way that you respond. The next stage here is uh, where you get into the young adult stage. And this is, this is where we lose a lot of our young people, a lot of our young adults. And you know, the reason why is because our whole life we've been taught the word of God, right? And then we get to this, this age where things become more abstract, where things uh, start to conflict with our faith traditions and the things that we've read in the Bible. And then we're tr- trying to compare the flood to scientific uh, uh, experiments and different things like that. And, we're, and it just doesn't make sense. And we're like, uh, I get so many questions like, well, you know, I was sitting in class, pastor, and then my professor said this. And I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense because I was taught, I was taught about the flood and about miracles my whole life, and, and yet it's not matching up. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, We serve a God that is hard for us to conceive. No mind has understood or can comprehend, nor eyes have seen, nor ears have heard. This is is a God that we're trying to make sense of. And this whole sermon series that we're talking about is this common faith, this this common idea or this intellectual type of faith uh, that really moves us out of our comfort zone when we're talking about believing in things that we can't even comprehend. And that's what we call an uncommon, or if I can use this word, family, a radical faith. And God wants to move us into this place where things are so uncommon that we're uncomfortable. Would you say amen? The great thing is this, is after that stage, we fall into this stage where we become adults. (laughs) And the studies actually say the beautiful thing is that we actually go back to that childhood stage where we take things literal. Where things, things again, right, we, we, we fall in love with God again. And we come to this point in our life where we own our faith and things are literal again. Like when you talk to young kids and you ask them something, right, they take things literally. And the Bible tells us that we need to have a childlike attitude or faith or belief, right, because the kingdom of heaven, right, is just that. So the Bible goes on to share with us these stages, right? And it brings me back to a childlike faith and believing the truth and the love that God shares with us. And in Matthew chapter 18, 2 and 4, Jesus says this. He says, he, he called all the children to him and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little what? Children. Can I tell you, the Bible doesn't tell us for children to be like adults, but it's always telling us to be like a child. And it says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of what? In the kingdom of heaven. The question was asked after that uh, class 
um, about the age groups. And they says, well, you know what, we, 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 we know where infancy goes up to becoming a toddler. We know these, these age that are already set in place. And then we know the different years that it is to, for you to be a toddler before you become an adolescent. And then the question was, well, well, then, what, what, what happens or what is the age an adolescent becomes an adult or a young adult? That was the question. And people started answering the question, well, I, I, I think it was, uh, I think, 18. As soon as you said 18, you're an adult, right? Because you're, you, 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 you're legal to do certain things, but not all things. And some says, well, yeah, you're right, but you're, you're not allowed to, uh, to buy alcohol, so 21. When you're 21, that's when you become an adult. And people say, well, I don't know, 21, you're, 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 still, you're still navigating through life. Some said 25. We even went all the way up to the age of 30 when we were discussing what age is it that you become an adult. And then it dawned on me, it's not dependent on your age, but it's dependent on the characteristics that makes you an adult. It's dependent on your maturity level and your responsibility level. That age, that see, that, that's why family, that we got 30-year-old men like me, where I was back in the day trying to act like I was 16 years old. That's why we've got, we've got young girls who are at the fifth, age of 15 who, who are trying to be 21. It's because, can I tell you, family, that it's not dependent on your age, but it's dependent on the characteristics that make you an adult. So can I transform this into your faith? Can I tell you that your faith isn't dependent on your age? It's dependent on the characteristics of your faith. That's why I've run into a lot of young people that are like at the age of 14 or 15 who have this awesome, authentic relationship with Jesus. And I'm saying to them, man, they've owned their faith. And then yet I've ran into some elders in our churches, right, that, that, that still haven't met Jesus, who are probably 60, 70 years old, who still struggle in developing their own faith. Because watch, it is not dependent on your age. It's dependent on the characteristics of your faith. So what does this tell us? It actually tells us that we are all at the same level when it comes to having an authentic, genuine relationship with Jesus doesn't discriminate on what age, what gender, or what ethnicity we are. It's dependent on the characteristics of our faith. There's two types of faith that we're going to cover today. The first one is this. I want to talk to you about a common faith. And the common faith is this. It relies on self, others, and systems. All right? When you think of a common faith, think of SOS, right? A common faith relies on self, it relies on others, and it relies on a system. The prophet Jeremiah writes this in uh, chapter 17, verse 5. It says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere, who rely on human, and in their hearts are away from the... What the prophet is saying is, is, is that oftentimes we would always depend on other people or on human efforts and on our own strength as opposed to that of God's. And what happens is this, is that the more that we depend on other things, the more that we depend on self, the more that we depend on others, we start to lose our faith and our connection with God. We actually, what we do is this, we replace God with other things. Sometimes we replace it with things that are tangible. Sometimes we place things around maybe relationships. But then oftentimes we depend more on these other things, self and others, as opposed to relying on God. And he says, when you do that, you're actually turning your heart away from God. And what God does with this, right, because this word repentance is this. It's not just speaking about the things that we've done wrong, but it's actually turning back to God. And God is wanting us to come back to him. If you ever read any of the prophets, major and minor, the number one theme through every prophet is how he can get God, right, how we can turn God's people back to God. A common faith. Psalms 118, 5 through 16, I love the message translation as it tells us this. It says, far better to take refuge in God than trust in who? In people. Far better to take refuge in God than to trust in who? In celebrities, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the message translation made it very, very contemporary and made it very relevant for us today because the, the other text that, that is in the King James Version said it's better to trust in the Lord than to put our confidence in princes, Right? And it says here in celebrities, because when, when, when I'm trying to think of what it is that we put our faith in today, oftentimes it's, it's what we see on television for our young people or even our adults. Sometimes it's what we see on social media. Sometimes it's what we read. We, we, we place these people on a pedestal, and we use these individuals as a benchmark of where we should live our life and how we should trust our life. But can I tell you something? 
that each one of these people, as far as we put our hope in others and other people, right, that, that they're going to fail us. Before I met the Lord, I was this crazy Raider fanatic, right? I love the I love the Oakland Raiders. I mean, it was crazy. I had every paraphernalia of the, of the Raiders. I had a big flag in my garage. My whole garage was transformed into this man cave where the Raiders were put up there on a pedestal that that, that I worshipped. So when the Raiders went to the Super Bowl, right? I I had this huge party at my house. I invited all my friends, all my family. Right? We shut down the whole block. But guess what? The Raiders lost that Super Bowl. <laughs> if you don't say amen, you better say ouch. So they lost the Super Bowl. So you know what happened? Because my faith was in a team. Right? I didn't go to, I didn't go to work for about a week. I, I asked my wife. I did not go to work for about a week, right? You know what? Right after they lost, I kicked everybody out of the party. Whether you're a Raider fan or a Tampa Bay fan, get out. Get out. Some of my best friends were like, they, they, they didn't talk to me for about a month because I was, so, I was so upset. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I didn't want to watch TV. So then since I put my faith in the team, I started to put my faith in alcohol abuse. Because at that time, I was an alcoholic. So guess what I did for that whole week? I drank. Right, because they lost the Super Bowl. Are you kidding me? And it wasn't until my wife came and told me, she's like, you know what? The Raiders ain't paying your bills. Amen. Have I shared with you how oftentimes God's voice sounds like my wife's voice? <laughs> All the men in the house say? Amen. Amen. Oftentimes that, that voice of reason God, are you speaking to me? It's, that, it's, it's your wife's voice. And she says, look, they're not paying your bills. They're not putting food on the table. Matter of fact, I bet you you could walk up to one of them. They wouldn't even know who you are. <laughs> Yet you're over here not going to work. Because this is what happens when we put our faith in self and we put our faith in others. God is saying, don't put your faith in self or in others. Put your faith in God. Here's, a, here's another part of a common faith that I want to share with you because not, not only is it the faith that we develop as far as believing in something to take place or to happen, but also in our faith traditions. There's a common faith tradition. Like even us as Adventists, right, we can fall into not only self or others, but here's the other thing that, the, that, that our third angel warns us of, right? It's like don't believe in systems. Some of us put more trust in a system than we do in a Savior. Mm. Sounds so nice, better say it twice. Don't believe in system, believe in the Savior. Don't trust the system, trust the Savior. Don't have faith in the system, have faith in the Savior. Don't walk through the system, walk with the Savior. The Bible tells us in the three angels' message, it is this beautiful message. Matter of fact, before we even go there, let me, let, me, let me just add a few more texts to there. Paul talks about this faith tradition that is misled and misinformed, that, that our faith is reliant on ourselves. It's about me, myself, and I. But Paul actually says it's not based on you. Your faith should be based in Jesus Christ. He says in Romans 10, verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. What Paul was saying is that these people were very active in their religion and in a system as opposed to the Savior. And trusting itself leads to us to be more committed to a religion than it is to a relationship. And Christ is calling us out to be part of a relationship with him. Paul continues in that same message. He says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own they did not submit to God's righteousness. These Jewish leaders at the time had ignored the truth that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Not this made-up system that focused on what I do as opposed to who I believe in. It was more about the duty than it was about anything else. And they put more trust in the system. And can I tell you that even Revelation 14, 9 through 12 warns us about putting faith in a system. It warns us, it tells us this, it says, Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be trans he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone into the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, rest day or night. Who worships the beast or the system and the image or the system and whoever receives the mark of his name. This is this in 12. This is what this is what God is calling us. He says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And watch this now. The what? The faith of who? Jesus Christ. Do not trust the system. Trust the Savior. Don't have faith in this system that is, that is, that is a smokescreen behind religion, but have faith in Jesus. A common faith trusts in self, trusts in others, and trusts in a system. But God calls us to have faith in him. Would you say Amen. Uncommon faith, again, family, is that of a child. <laughs> Jesus doesn't say for us to be like adults. He says the total opposite. He calls us to be like children. And at the same time, it says again, who is this, the greatest in heaven? And he called a child. Like he says, for truly I tell you, he says, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I was reading an article about seven childlike traits that can uh, really bring to light why Jesus was encouraging us about this faith. The first thing about a child-like trait is this. Number one is that children are very curious, right? For those of us that have children, they have this curiosity about them, right? Where they're asked, they're always asking, but why? But why, Daddy? You know, and I grew up in an era where if I asked, but why? It, I, the answer was because I, because you can't do that to kids nowadays, Amen. Amen, kids in the house? Right, because now they're, man, they're just, they're far more intelligent, man. I'm not, the other day I'm sitting at the table, I'm trying to do math, right? And this is like a seventh, my, my, my son is seven years old. He's over there doing this math, and I'm like looking at it, and he's like, well, why, Dad? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I do? I said, call Marley over here. Marley, you're the math whiz. Come here and Show your brother what this is about, right? It didn't make sense to me. It was a foreign language to me. But God calls us, right, to, to, to have this Christ-like, this, this childlike trait, right? It's, it's that he, he wants us to have this desire, this curiosity. Can I tell you it's curiosity that, that, that births this hunger and desire for righteousness? It's like if you don't have a curiosity of what, what, what God's word is saying and how it's speaking life, then we'll never know God's real truths and where God is leading us. So have, a, have that sense of curiosity. The other one is excitement, right? Like kids are excited about everything. They wake up, they're excited. My kids, they wake up, and they're just like running around the house, grabbing clothes. You know, my, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm still waking up. Please, like, calm down, keep it, keep it quiet. They're, they're excited, about, excited about going to school. I don't remember being excited about going to school. <laughs> now, can I tell you a story? Even my sons, they get excited about punishment. I kid you not. The other day, like when we used to live out in the Moreno Valley, right? Uh, we had, we had. I, I share about my dog, a shadow, a little chow chow. And like, well, some of my punishments would be like, you know what? Go outside and pick up the poop. Go take the shovel, grab the trash can. You two, go outside. I don't want to see you right now. Go over there, clean the backyard, pick up all the poop. So they go out there, right? And then, like ten minutes later, I hear, wee, woo. There's laughing. There's, I'm like, they did. This is, shouldn't be an exciting task to do. <laughs> this is punishment. And I get out there, you know what they did? Right? They set the trash can on the other side of the backyard, right? And they're over here trying to make baskets with the shovel and throwing. <laughs> it's like, what is punishment nowadays? Really? God wants us to be excited. He wants this excitement. Faith is exciting, especially in the process of when we're waiting for this to take place. And God gives us a revelation. God wants us not only to be curious, right, but excitement. And then again, again, the word faith, right? If, if, if you say something to a young child, they believe it with all their heart, right? Be careful where to tell them. Sometimes I tell them, I, I'm the strongest man in the world, right? I like to put myself up in front of my boys, right? 
Yeah, I could do that. I could pick that up. I could beat that person up, right? But be careful if I, that person's there. They're like, Dad, you said you could beat him up. They're like, Shh. oh, son, it was an exaggeration. You know, the Bible does hyperboles. You know, we're just kind of, you know, they take it literally. God wants us to have that Christ-like curiosity, excitement, and faith. The next one is this. I was reading an article. It's trust, right? Children trust their parents to take care of them. There's just trust. And can I tell you, this is even known even in an abusive environment. They still have this faith and this trust in the parent. The parent knows what's beneficial for the child. You know, the hardest thing we had to do yesterday was say goodbye to my son, right? He like, go back to college. And I'm saying to myself, it don't get easier. Like, I'm thinking to myself, we all grown now. He's, 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 a, he's a young adult. I'm grown. But every time we got to say goodbye, it's like, man, my heart breaks. And we're sitting there at the airport crying, right? And then he starts crying too. And I'm over here going, man, this is not easy. Because easy, like, you know what? We could have easily said, you know what? You just stay home, Right? But you, you know what? But we know and he knows that we wouldn't be encouraging him to go if we didn't think that this is what he was on, this path that he's taking isn't beneficial for his life. So he, even though we don't want him to go and he doesn't want to go, he trusts us to know that, hey, my parents, they're supporting me to go this direction. And this is something I'm called to do. It's called adulting. Amen. And you, I've got to go. And even though I'm not here at home, it's like I trust my parents to know that they're sending me knowing that I'm going to be okay. Right, so there's that trust level. Number five is this. There's this wonder, right? Kids, are like, when, when they're just amazed at almost every, like, we went to uh, Elder Dave and Gail's house uh, to eat the other day. We had, a, we had a nice dinner there. But as soon as they put out this little robot ball that you can control on, like, any, like, a tablet or on a phone, right, and this thing just <laughs> lights up and goes all over the house. Man, the kids were, wow, they, they lit up. You know, I have kids, like, once they get caught on something, they won't eat anything until that thing runs out of battery or breaks. <laughs> right? Because they're so, they're, they just, everything's just a wonder to them. Right? Can I tell you, man, when, when God does stuff that I've been praying for or, or even gives me a revelation, of, I just, I'm just in awe. And I'm just like, you know, I'm in awe to a point where, like, God, I'm not worthy of this. But yet God puts me in a position to where, where I don't neglect that, that I'm just so thankful and grateful for what he's doing. Number six is this. Kids have a short memory. Amen. Amen. Right? God calls us. Like, adults, we need to take this seriously. I, I deal with couples that aren't hysterical. They're historical. And the reason why I say historical is because they like to bring up stuff that happened way, 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 way back. Right? Have you ever been right? Come on. Like, for, for a long time, man, I would hold this against Linda. I, I had an issue with her, and I would always bring it up. Like, years after, I, if I knew I couldn't win a fight, guess what? I'd go back seven, eight years ago. Well, that, that one time in 1999, you know, we go historical. But kids, they have a short memory. My son's, like, they're fighting one time. They're like, hey, you're not my brother. I'm like, whoa, that's, that's tough. Three minutes later, hey, come on, let's go over here. You know, they're just, they have a short memory. There's this, there's this love and this forgiveness about them that they, they you know, they, they don't take things so personal. They have a short memory. The last is this, kids are persistent. Amen, amen, parents. And don't tell my boys that we're going to go to McDonald's. I tell you, they will hold me to it. And they will not bug me until we go. And I would forget and get at home, and, you know, and I'm like, they're like, you said we were going to go to McDonald's. I know I said that, son, but, you know, things got a little bit. But you said that we were going to go to McDonald's. <laughs> okay, son, then can we go tomorrow? No, you said we were going to go today when you picked us up after school. We were going to go to McDonald's. Okay, I understand that, son. Can we go tomorrow? Then the next day, guess what? I got to buy him two things from McDonald's, right? So it's like <laughs> they never forget. Right, they're, they're, they're very, very persistent. Zion's been asking me, Dad, you know, about a year and a half ago, we, we were at um, a Pathfinder Campery in Texas. And as we were doing the appeal and hundreds of kids were coming up to get baptized, Zion looks at me and goes, Dad, I want to get baptized. 
And at this time, he was just like, he was, I think he was like five and a half, maybe six years old. And he says, yeah, I would love to do that. But don't, we want our mom and your family to be there too, to experience it. We want to do it as a family. And I says, yeah, I don't mind. Yes, let's do it, right? And I says, you know what? Matter of fact, we can go home and we can start Bible studies. And we got home, right? And, and like for the first few months, man, I had to get back to this, this crazy schedule. And Zion kept telling me, Dad, when are we doing our Bible studies? When are we doing our Bible studies? Come on, I want to get baptized. When are we doing our Bible studies? So for the past year, man, I've been trying to do Bible studies him and fit him in the schedule because he will not let up until he finishes his Bible studies because he wants to get baptized. Amen. They are very persistent. They are very persistent. Can I tell you this? That an uncommon faith is wrapped up in believing and persisting that God will do what God says he will do. God will do exactly what he says he will do. But that uncommon faith can only be developed when we are in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, as I close with this story about Lazarus, because I know that was our target text, there's so much that you can extract from that text. There's so many biblical principles that you can pull from it. But I actually just want to tell the story as a framework of where, what, what an uncommon faith is. Right? Because the common, uncommon faith, right, it's, it thrives in the arena of relationship. As you read the first part of the text in John chapter 11, verse 1 through 3, the Bible starts off by telling us a story that says that now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of, of Mary and his sister Martha, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And he says, therefore, the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And I tell you that the story doesn't just start off by the sickness. It actually starts off by giving us a relationship. It tells us about a relationship that Jesus had with the, with the sisters and then, then also suggests that Jesus loved Lazarus, right? He was telling them, he goes, look, so the Bible tells us this. It's not about the sickness or the crisis. It begins with the relationship. Because oftentimes, right, we will ask a God that we don't talk to, that we don't pray to, that we don't worship, to do things for us in faith that we don't even have a connection with. And God is saying this, is that faith is brewed and faith is developed in the atmosphere, in the arena of a relationship. So the story starts off by talking about the relationship Jesus had with this family. Can I tell you, family, uh, there's, there's often times, right? So growing up, I had, I had this really big uh, Jamaican friend of mine. He's like my brother now. Seven foot, we call him tiny. Yeah, I know. So he, he became an actor. He, he's been on a couple of movies, and um, uh, he, he's been on, on a lot of commercials. Um, and, and, like, before he got there, he was a security guard, a lead security guard to some of the high-end restaurants out in Hollywood. And back then, you know, I was broke as a joke. I had no job. But he would invite me to go to these high-end restaurants, right? So me and Linda would go there in this 1986 uh, Toyota Corolla, right? It was, it was a bucket, and we would drive up to these high-end restaurants in Hollywood in this bucket, right? And you know what? The car had no shocks, right? So if I would hit the brakes, like, the whole front end would drop. And so I used to embarrass Linda and pull up. i go, watch, honey. And it looked like we had... <laughs> it looked like we had hydraulics, right? But no, it was just the, no shocks, right? So we would pull up to these restaurants, and we would park our car next to some fine Mercedes Benz and... Bentleys and Hummers, right? And here's this little Corolla with a big Samoan guy coming out of it, right? And then we would walk up to the front, and guess what? We would, there would be a line around the block on Sunset where people are trying to get into this, this spot. And guess what? We would just walk up to the front. People knew who I was. They would move that whole little, that little, uh, the little rope, right? And then we would walk right in. And then people would look at us crazy, and they would look at the security like, why, why did they get in? And he's like, because they have a relationship. They have a relationship. I used to haul freight. And I used to eat. If you, if you know anything about the trucking business, when you get to your delivery, if you have an appointment, right, they, they take you in either on the appointment or they'll cancel your appointment. Right? I, I had such a good relationship with the people over there on the docks that I would come early, hours early, so I could get some freight off early and go home early, or I would come late. But it didn't matter what time I came. I would park my rig. I would go inside to the dispatch. they say, what's up, Meshach? I'm like, hey, I'm here. They'd give me a clearance, give me a door, and all these people that are waiting, guess what? I'd bump the dock, get unloaded, and I'm gone. Why? It's because I had a relationship. 
with these individuals. This just past Thursday, God opened a platform for me and a few other Polynesian young professionals right, to speak on behalf of the disparities in education towards Polynesian kids, Native Hawaiian and PI kids in the county of Riverside. There was over a thousand educators at the Excellence Through Equity Conference. Right, and, 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 and we were able to use that platform to speak on behalf of our Polynesian kids that struggle. And when we got there, right, you know, and I go full garm, you know, when we have a cultural Sabbath here, Aloha shirt, and then also the, the wraparound and everything, right? And people are kind of like, what is this guy doing here, right? He's not an educator. And me and this, these other young professionals who are very inspiring, two young ladies that, that came, that worked in education and other in mental health, they, they came and we, we were able to speak on behalf. And when we get there, we're speaking on a platform that's normally not given just to anybody. And can I tell you, the reason why we got there is because her son went to school with Marley, and I spoke at Marley's gradu uh, high school uh, graduation ceremony. And after I spoke, she came up and she's like, I need you to come and, and speak for, for this event. And I would have never got there had we not have a relationship. Family, their faith begins with a relationship. The Bible goes on to tell us as this, right, is that, huh, that Jesus got word and says sickness is not unto death. And so what he does, he takes two days to chill out and another two days to travel back to get to his friend. Right, and the Bible tells us that as, as Jesus is coming, coming, coming there, it's like Je that, that Lazarus dies in the process of Jesus going. Can I share this with you? Some things have to die while you wait. While that faith prayer is being developed, some things in your life, the reason why God takes his time is because there's certain things in your life that just needs to die before he gets there. There's a relationship that you're in that God's like, that needs to die before you get there. There's somebody you're talking to that needs to die before you get there. Sometimes your pride has to die before he gets there. Sometimes uh, yourself, right, has to die before you get there. Sometimes your common understanding of how things should work needs to die before Jesus gets there. So in the waiting, in the waiting, God takes his time. Because he already knows what's going to take place. But some things in your life, and I don't know what it is, it needs to die before Jesus gets there. It needs to die. You need to get to a point where you can say, you know what, I can't do it no more. Can, can I say this? And I'm not talking about quitting. But sometimes letting go is the best thing you could do during, while, during this process of waiting. Sometimes you're like, you know, Lord, I can't take this relationship anymore. That's yours. Lord, I've done everything I can. That's yours. Lord, this sickness, this situation, my living situation, I can't, I have, it's out of my control, Lord. It's yours. Sometime releasing relieves such a burden on you to come to realize it is not your burden to carry. So God says, let go. Watch this now. <laughs> Watch this now. Because the Bible tells us, right, that now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary and were comforting them. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. And verse 21 says this, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And when you read this text, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Martha was upset. Let's, let's keep it real. The, the Savior of the world, my friend, my good friend that I have a relationship, was taking his time. He's not here yet. My brother died. But guess what? The Bible says after that text, but even now. You didn't get it. Now Martha said to him, Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. But even now. So what this tells us is this. Let me tell you something. She was upset, but she still didn't lose faith. She was in pain, but she didn't lose faith. Uh, she was in the valley, but she didn't lose faith. 
She was in the mix, but she didn't lose faith. She was in discomfort, but she didn't lose faith. She was depressed, but she didn't lose faith. I don't know who I'm talking to out there. She was in desolation, but she didn't lose faith. She was down and out, but she didn't lose faith. She was angry, but she didn't lose faith. She had anxiety, but she didn't lose faith. She was a mess, but she didn't lose faith. She was misled and misinformed, but she didn't lose faith. She was heartbroken. She didn't lose faith. She was a hothead, but she didn't lose faith. Why? Because it wasn't an uncommon. It wasn't just a common faith. It was an uncommon faith. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 22 that she says, but even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. My heart is broken, but even now. This relationship stinks, but even now. I got family who's sick, but even now. I'm struggling with an addiction, but even now. I can't kick this habit, but even now. My work is getting on my nerves, but even now. I can't stand these people at church, but even now. But even now. I'm losing the house, Lord, but even now. The car is gone, Lord, but even now. My family's in shambles, God, but even now. My marriage is on the rock, Lord, but even now. I can't even graduate this year, Lord, but even now. But even now. I know. I know. He says, but even now, I know. Whatever you ask of God, God will give you. God will give you. And you know why God will give to whatever Jesus asks? It's because Jesus has a relationship with the Father.